Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, another session of the Leuven Seminar uh, and uh, another series of sessions of the Leuven Seminar because it's the first one of the fall uh, 2024. And uh, we are very pleased to have the first session of the term uh, with a paper by Angelica Nuzzo. Uh, we will be discussing, as you know, a pre-circulated paper by her on Hegel's philosophy of right and the idea of the world. Um, Angelica Nuzzo is professor of philosophy at the City University of New York, and her main areas of interest are German idealism, so Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, uh, modern philosophy and enlightenment, ethics, political philosophy, uh, globalization, and philosophy of translation. She's the author of several articles and several monographs. And I will just mention here three monographs uh, published by her. Uh, so uh, Approaching Hegel's Logic Obliquely, uh, Melville, Moliere, and Beckett, uh, published by Sunny Press in 2018. Uh, another monograph, uh, Memory, History, and Justice in Hegel, uh, published in 2012 by Palgrave, and um, Ideal Embodiment, Kant's Theory of Sensibility, published by Indiana University Press in uh, 2008. Uh, so we are uh, very happy that uh, Angelica accepted uh, our invitation and uh, the responded to uh, Angelica's paper will be uh, Charlotte Baumann, uh, Charlotte Baumann is assistant professor at the chair of theoretical philosophy at uh, the Fern Uni Universität Hagen. And uh, her main areas of expertise include the, the history of social, social and political philosophy, epistemology, and philosophy of science. Uh, she has published primarily on Kant, Hegel, Marx, and Neo Kantians, but she's also interesting. Uh, Dubois, critical uh, race theory, and post-colonialism. Uh, she's the author also of several articles, uh, and I will just mention some that are perhaps uh, the most relevant for the discussion today. Uh, so the paper Hegel on external teleology and market laws, uh, published in the Hegel Bulletin, uh, already online ahead of print. Um, another paper titled uh, Was Hegel an Authoritarian Thinker, uh, published in Archiv for Geschichte der Philosophie in 2021, and uh, Irrationality and Egoism in Hegel's Account of Right in the British Journal for the History of Philosophy in 2018. So the structure of the session will be the following. Uh, Angelica will uh, briefly present uh, uh, the paper that has been uh, pre-circulated. Then we'll have a response by Charlotte, uh, followed by uh, uh, Angelica's uh, reply to uh, Charlotte's response. And then we'll have a general uh, Q&A uh, open to the entire audience. So as usual, I would like to ask you to switch on your videos in case possible, uh, as it gives us the nice impression as if we were sharing the same room uh, in reality. And, uh, and after the session, we will leave the Zoom meeting open for informal conversations. And you're all uh, warmly invited to stay connected for this as well. So uh, thank you, Angelica, and thank you, Charlotte, for kindly accepting our invitation. And uh, Angelica, please, uh, the floor is yours. OK, well, thank you for the invitation. This is always a pleasure to be in this uh, Leuven seminar. Um, so I'm uh, grateful for you to put it together uh, during the years now. Uh, okay, so so um, just to uh, summarize a little bit uh, what I'm uh, doing and what my interests are in this uh, essay, um, I'm really uh, looking at a general question, which is really the question of what kind of theory is uh, Hegel's uh, social political theory um, consigned to the philosophy of right, because uh, many interpretive de debate really um, 
go back to uh, um, an un lack of clarity as to what kind of theory is Hegel's theory. In particular, I said it uh, with Hegel against two models of political theory. One is the idealist uh, utopian one that is exemplified for Hegel by Plato and Kant. And on the other hand, uh, against the historicist positivist uh, school of uh, uh, right, uh, and uh, Hegel's reference here is usually Gustav Hugo. Uh, so um, why do I do this? Well, Hegel's theory of the state and the political reality is a theory that Hegel underlines has the idea of right, the idea of the state as his topic. So what's the difference between uh, Hegel's uh, theory uh, centered on the idea and idealist theories? On the other hand, uh, we all know that um, the philosophy of right culminates in the moment of Weltgeschichte. So uh, history and a philosophy of history is an integral part of Hegel's theory of right. So what is the difference here between Hegel's idea of the historicity of social and political structures and uh, the uh, historicist school? In order to uh, set up uh, my uh, position, I look at a central passage of the preface of the philosophy of right that has been commented on a million times. And that's the passage that claims that what philosophy is, is the comprehension of the present world, gegenwärtige Welt. Now, usually uh, the literature insists on the dimension of the present and hence on the historical dimension of the philosophical comprehension. Instead, I really want uh, to uh, draw the concept of the world to the center and uh, really look at what is uh, the world for Hegel. And uh, in that passage of the philosophy of right, of the preface to the philosophy of right, Hegel is really um, looking at the world as the limit of the philosophical comprehension. And Aesop's uh, hic rodus hic saltus is really the, 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 the very concise uh, claim that here Hegel is uh, putting forth as to say, uh, philosophy has to deal with the world, what is actual in the world. You cannot leap, usually uh, we say you cannot leap uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, your time, but I want to say, Hegel is also saying you cannot leap uh, beyond the dimension of the world. The world is actually the uh, horizon within which all philosophical activity is uh, inscribed. And that is, uh, I think, something that is uh, certainly not self-evident. Why shouldn't uh, philosophy be concerned with uh, something that is not in this world? But I think Hegel's claim is a very strong one and a very interesting one. So um, bringing the concept of the world to the center, I look at the uh, two uh, other places in order to frame Hegel's position. One is uh, the development uh, in uh, the Kantian critique. So uh, what interests me is really to see how for Kant, uh, we're dealing with uh, two, at least two different concepts of the world. One is the more scholastic one, the other is the uh, what Kant calls a cosmic co uh, conceptus cosmicus, and that is a moral concept. Okay, so uh, in, I look at that passage of the Architectonic of the Doctrine of Method, where Kant is saying uh, the concept of the world 
hints at uh, die ganze Bestimmung des Menschen. So it's really uh, an ideal that has a kind of moral determination. And importantly, uh, the concept of the world in this sense is necessarily disjoined from the concept of the world as the world of nature. Uh, but I also look at Hegel's uh, criticism in the positions of thought towards objectivity of the metaphysical and the empiricist concept of the world. And I come to the uh, conclusion, uh, and this is the claim that I present, that the world for Hegel is not an idea in the Kantian sense, is not an ens in the sense of metaphysics, and it's not an object. Uh, the world is a process, is the process of the self-actualization of spirit, so I say uh, objective spirit is precisely the process of the world. So this is why the philosophy of right is really the place where we find Hegel's theory of the world. So uh, that's why I call it uh, a political cosmology. So I want to say uh, this is sort of where the cosmological problem somehow ends up with Hegel, it ends up within the realm of spirit and within the realm of spirit self-actualization. Um, so the, in the last part of the paper, uh, I, um, I say that in order to understand really what kind of political theory is, uh, Hegel providing us with, we have to look at the method. In other words, uh, what is really distinctive is the way in which this process that is the political world is um, actualized, is articulated in its philosophical presentation. And, uh, and here I look at uh, the first section of the philosophy of right where Hegel says, um, the topic of the philosophy of right is um, the concept of right and its realization, its actualization of Verwirklichung, but also the process of its Gestaltung. So here I want to say, uh, going back and then I conclude, going back to the point that I was making before, what is the difference between uh, Hegel uh, doctrine that deals with the idea of the state, with the concept of right and its actualization and uh, idealist uh, theories. Well, the difference is that the idea for uh, Hegel is immediately actual. Uh, so it doesn't, um, it doesn't go to beyond the world into another ideal reality that is uh, in need of actualization. And, uh, and then I look at the second aspect, with, which is the historical dimension. And um, I say the distinctive historical uh, cipher of the actualization of the concept is in this concept of Gestaltung, uh, the way in which um, the concept uh, gives itself not just Wirklichkeit, but also existence in the realm of contingent forms. Um, there is a difference between the contingency of uh, that uh, Hegel makes fun of when he says, uh, well, Fichte uh, got distracted and just uh, spent his time uh, making, uh, in giving instructions of how to figure out the passport regulations. Those are contingencies that are purely contingent. And for Hegel, they have really no place in a theory of right. There is a difference between that and what is considered a, the contingency 
produced by the concept itself in its figuration. So this is the historical element that Hegel is bringing in. In other words, he's drawing a distinction between uh, two types of the historical, the positive historical, which is not a matter of philosophical attention, and the historical that instead is the historicity of the concept, and that's the task of uh, the philosopher to uh, disclose. So I, I think I stop here. Maybe I even went beyond the 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll say more with the discussion. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, um, Angelica. So uh, Charlotte, now the floor is yours. Yes, uh, well, thank you very much uh, for this interesting paper and for the for the invite, obviously. Um, I brought a little PowerPoint, let's see. It should work. Oh, sorry. This is actually, wait a minute. What's up here? Okay. Just, can you? Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, um, I can say, well, I have a lot of sympathy, sympathy with the problem Angelica is raising, and I agree like with the way she's uh, framing it. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure if I agree with the solution, but what I'm going to do is uh, just re paraphrase the issue, the solution, and maybe the doubts or questions I have about uh, the letter. Um, okay, sorry. There's a, hmm, okay. <laughs> sorry, a little. How do I go? Like this. Okay. Um, so the issue, I, as I would frame it, I would say, like, how do, do, do the following elements uh, fit together in Hegel's social philosophy? There's this descriptive and the normative element, the historic. Um, they are, both elements are always, I'm talking like, I'm using like three different kinds of framing it that Angela, Angelica also uses, but they're basically more or less referring to, to the same two aspects, right? So there's a descriptive and a normative element in Hegel's social philosophy. And I would say, well, you can say, translate it as saying, he talks about societies as they exist and societies like what this is best society would be or ought to be, right? That's a normative element. And then he talks about uh, social, like the society as historically and logically grounded. So the social as it has come about actually in history as opposed to, and as well, it, and he talks about the 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 um, social as it is, like would be most logically coherent, right? So there's those two aspects, and the the third way of framing it is saying that is to say that there's he's talking about the idea of state or statehood and the merely existent. Well, obviously they don't completely match the, the always the two oppositions, but they're very close. So he's talking about the social order in so far as it incorporates the logical structure or standard that Hegel calls the idea. Uh, and he's also talking about aspects of social reality that emerged kind of contingently that, that are merely there and don't really have uh, any like logical grounding, so to say. Um, and uh, Angelica frames this, um, the problem in, in terms of these oppositions, I would say. and. Uh, and she opposes Hegel to alternative positions, which would be kind of on the one hand positivism, that you simply look at the empirical and, and affirm it, right, in a historicist manner, or what I have I've called a bad idealism or utopianism. Um, yes, because, well, yeah, now I have already a first question for Angelica uh, about, because she sometimes talks about ideal theory. Uh, even I, I checked it on the PDF and there was ideal theory, the word which is um, maybe it's, it's only a terminological issue, but it sounds to me, it makes me think obviously of brawls um, and this kind of idea theory. Um, but it also makes me wonder like um, whether Rawls is already doing something that Hegel is, is intending to do in a way because he, he has this ideal, he talks about ideals and fiction, but he's also based on the actual world. That's a critique, for example, in Mills, right? That he that Rawls um, abstracts from, from the actual kind of capitalist, whatever, racist society. So there is something actual and something ideal and that's kind of mixed. So I guess there would be a question of like, whether it's important to first distinguish you, um, distinguish um, 
roles from the other bad idealists and, and then roles also from Hegel. Uh, okay, but I'm coming back to my main topic. So, so the, the solution uh, that Angelica proposes um, uh, has like different elements and I'm, I just jotted them down. So the world is spirit's world uh, and an activity or dynamic process that is holistic or anti-dualist and consists in a system within which philosophical reason is constituted and finds rationality in its objects or relations. And this, this world of spirit contains, is, all, is both moral and natural as opposed to Kant and in, involves nature and freedom and it involves self-production and intersubjectivity and multiple layers. And one point that I found very interesting is uh, that it involves both necessity and contingency, right? This is this moment of Gestaltung that you have both the, the actual, actualization of the rational core or idea and then the kind of contingent forms in which it appears, the Gestaltung. But also and just now when Angela spoke, she, she distinguished two types of Gestaltung, one that's more necessary and one that's more contingent. I, I think, <laughs> I mean, I'm, so I'm a, I'm a bit confused about this, but I, I find it um, intriguing and would like to know more. So uh, I guess my, so what exactly are we looking at here? I, I'm, I would need a bit more like um, uh, positioning, more like explication. Um, explanation, so which exact solution are we looking at? I think, you know, always we can like in the in the reception of Hegel, you can have like more historicist or historical and more like normative accounts. And I'm not quite sure where Angelica is um, located. So it would be option A would be to say, are we talking about a process in which individuals intersubjectively make their world and justify parts of it? Like similarly, as you find uh, the picture of Hegel in pragmatist Hegelians, I mean, like Pinkert and McDowell and so on, Pippin. Um, or are we talking about the idea as a logical deeper structure or system that is actualized in certain institutions, but also has a meaning and validity in its own right, i.e. A, a, a historically. And, and um, so does this logically determined structure allow us to evaluate historical worlds, right? So in, in, in on the second version, you would have the logic, rather strong reading of Hegel's logic, and you would say, the idea is not just like rationality in some vague sense of us giving reasons, but it's more about a specific structure of like organic interrelations or whatever uh, that that Hegel proposes as as the best, as a logically best and politically best kind of relations that we should have. Um, yes, so these are I guess the two options, and they have like both would have like uh, problems or issues. So I'm coming to my um, worries and possible critique. First, I have like general worries, right? Uh, in what sense is nature part of spirit self-production for you, right? Um, yes, are we talking about God in the sense a spirit God and making the nature or, you know, how can nature be part of spirit self-production? How can the configuration or Gestaltung be both contingent and necessary? I already mentioned that. How are nature and freedom linked? In what sense is the actualization of the idea necessary? And then I guess a question that is kind of, uh, um, I think we can't completely uh, forget in this context, like what does this mean with regard to racism and colonialism and Hegel, right? If we talk about necessary development of freedom and history of philosophy, I guess we, we have to uh, address that. And um, then the question is, if option A is correct, you know, how do we account for the normative element of Hegel's series? Like in the pragmatist Hegelian account, the norms are only, fe only featured descriptively, right? When pragmatist Hegelian talk about norms, I mean like what people actually believe to be valid at a specific moment in time. But um, I kind of think Hegel wants to say something more about what's like right, what's good, like in general more, yeah, right? And, uh, and that would be kind of missing if you if you take the pragmatist stance. And, and also the question would be, what, what does logically grounded mean? Like how, if we're trying to unite the idea that it's both historically and logically grounded, like how would the logical actually, uh, what would be the importance of the logical element, right? Um, does it only mean individuals can give an account of their norms, you know, as, as you can find in Brandom? 
or does it mean something like more substantive? If you go for option B, then um, obviously you can write, ask the opposite question, like what's the role of the empirical in this picture? Would it be enough to deduce the best world, social world from Hegel's logic? How do we avoid that idealism and, and how do we, how can we like make a focus or, or give due respect to Hegel's logic and say that it has like social relevance without ending up saying like the logic determines what's ideal for everybody and, and we don't have to look at the empirical and the historical WhatsApp. So uh, yes, these are my uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. So Angelica, now you, you have uh, yes. some minutes to uh, read. Thank you, thank you, Charlotte, for this. Um, um, uh, you, you raise a lot of things, so let's see how I can uh, uh, sort of try to answer to the majority of it a little uh, in a concise way. Uh, well, okay, ideal theory. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad you picked on this. Um, let, let's say um, ideal theory, you, you correctly uh, see that that's a, a sort of a post Hegelian uh, uh, way of uh, talking and it refers to Rawls. Actually, uh, I was uh, uh, really uh, engaging in part of a, a broader discussion is, that is the discussion, actually the criticism of uh, that Charles Mills wages against Rawls' ideal theory. And uh, what uh, Charles Mills uh, is uh, really attacking uh, is uh, uh, the Kantianism that he sees uh, in Rawls' political theory. And uh, my point is that what Mills is really not seeing uh, is that, that uh, the realist theory that he's advocating against uh, Rawls and the Kantian tradition is actually very Hegelian. So uh, that goes back to Charles Mills and the uh, racial contract. But uh, actually I am in this paper, I'm uh, simply using, I use a, a, a modern post Hegelian term, but I really want to say um, what Hegel is uh, attacking is a conception of the ideal uh, that is really the names that he brings up are uh, Plato and Kant and are really uh, what Hegel takes issue with is really the idea that the good and the political state is something posited in an ideal world. And he's saying, even in the case of Plato, that's not the case. Because as much as uh, um, Plato was outlining the ideal state, that was actually, and I think that is interpretatively extremely accurate, uh, was just projecting his own time <laughs> into that ideal. He was projecting the uh, qualms uh, and the pitfalls of the Athenian democracy. So you can't escape the dimension of your own time and your own world, even if you're trying to do ideal theory. Um, but you're right that I think that what is really at stake is the status of what we call ideas because you mentioned uh, there is also the other option of ideas in the more the Marxist traditions as being abstracted or even Trendelenburg is already waging this objection against Hegel, uh, ideas as abstraction from reality. Okay, so uh, that's one thing. Um, the, the issue of Gestaltung, that's really what, is something that interests me uh, a lot. And um, I think I can tie that to your question with regard to necessity and contingency. Uh, as we all know, I mean, uh, the, the term Gestalt and Gestaltung is really at the center of the, in the phenomenology of spirit. That's where we're talking about figures of consciousness. But um, actually, I think that uh, the, uh, the concept of Gestalt and Gestaltung is really 
crucial in order to understand what the difference between the logic and the so-called real philosophy is because the uh, real difference between the logic and the uh, philosophy of nature and spirit is not so much that one is abstract and the other is concrete. Uh, and so I, I try to avoid the, the, the whole issue of how I, the idea is instantiated in, uh, in the in the real world i don't think that that's uh, or whether the ca categories are, are applied or uh, or the other relation that interpreters usually mobilize in order to understand the relation between the idea of the logic and the real philosophy i i think that much more useful is the concept of figuration so what hegel is saying is after the logic Con the concept gives itself real figures. Um, and what are those figures? Okay, those figures are uh, have a necessity in the sense that is the concept that actualizes itself, okay, in reality, but are also have an aspect of contingency in the sense that there may be different figures corresponding to the same manifestation of the concept. And those figures have also historical validity, okay, are contingent in the historical development. So when we talk about the structure of the family, for example, that is a figure of the natural uh, related aspect of spirit in its objectivity. So it's a figure of the immediacy, conceptual immediacy that we find at the level of objective spirit. So the figure adds a dimension that is real, but it's also contingent, but is the contingency that sort of uh, envelops this the concept. So that passage of the uh, preface of the philosophy of right, where Hegel is uh, describing the surface of reality is the shine of existence. And then the deeper layer is the idea. And he's saying, he's not simply saying, okay, philosophy capture the idea at the center of reality and uh, ordinary consciousness simply dwell at the surface on the level of contingent existence. He's also saying, and I think that is really the interesting part, the task of the philosopher is to connect the shine, okay, that is contingent and transitory to the core of the idea. So that's really, the, the the central issue and i think that breaks that kind of dualism okay between the idea and the reality the necessity and the contingency and the gestalt the figure is precisely what connects the two and with that i guess uh i want to say i i want to uh scramble the the clear cut dichotomy between option A and option B. I, I want to say things are more complicated on both sides. Uh, it's not a deduction of the best world from the idea. It's not a, an either or, either we leave the empirical out or the empirical becomes the dominant. Um, uh, and so I, I want to say what I've been trying to do is sort of uh, break out of, of that kind of clear cut opposition between the option one and option two, A and B, that I don't think really, um, if we hold on to those options, we can't move beyond uh, 
the types of reading of Hegel's philosophy of right that I think uh, continue to sort of uh, get us into the same kind of uh, um, problems with no real solution as we got from the very beginning when uh, uh, the link and right, uh, link and uh, rechts and link Hegelians were saying is Hegel a revolutionary or is he a reactionary? So uh, I, I don't, I guess we need to sort of uh, uh, change a little bit the conversation. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll stop here. I, I'm sure, uh, and I want to thank you, uh, Charlotte, for this uh, response. And I'm sure we're gonna uh, touch upon other points in the discussion. Great, thank you so much. And uh, now the, the floor is open for questions and please uh, use the raise hand function in Zoom. And in case it's not working or you don't know how to do it, just uh, raise your physical hand or post your question in chat and we'll find a solution so that you'll be heard. Um, and so the floor is open. Um, yeah, Manuel. Okay, thank you, Luis. Um, thank you, Angelica, for this um, for this fascinating paper. I really, I really enjoyed reading it, and I think I'm very sympathetic with the idea that the work constitutes the limits of uh, Hegel's political philosophy in a sense that is somehow the where the political reflection is embedded um and i liked also yeah the way you reconstruct this relationship between contingency and necessity through the concept of gestaltung i think that that's that's very useful to grasp how uh, contingency can be thought in very various manner according to Hegel. And my question would be, uh, I think it was also part of uh, Charlotte's uh, worries or critiques, um, and is related to what would be your answer to the, this, to certain new readings of Hegel that uh, present a so-called naturalist perspective in which they emphasize the fact that the process of self-actualization of the spirit, uh, because it has this imminence in the world, has to give an account of the natural side of this actualization. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that this is uh, maybe interesting to explore um, I'd say, yeah, the consequences of this uh, worldly or this attention to the situationality of uh, political thinking in in Hegel. I will, I'm curious to know what is your your vision, your view on this. And thank you again. Okay, so so basically, the role of nature, uh, yeah, that was a point that Charlotte was doing, uh, uh, raising too, in the self actualization of spirit. Uh, yes, I, I think that's an important thing, um, an important point. And I think that in uh, I in in claiming that the world is the dimension in which reason is inscribed, and also in seeing that um, uh, Hegel is reacting against the important Kantian separation between the world of nature and the moral cosmos, okay? Uh, that has a consequence, okay? Uh, the world, I insist, is one, but rationality responds to the demand of the world. So as much as it is true that the world as the objective world of spirit is the self-actualization of reason, is also true that the world has a component, which is the natural component that is really 
irreducible to the self-actualization of spirit. Nature is not a product of spirit. Uh, nature remains a, an aspect of that world that is one. So I want to say nature is neither separated into another world, like in the case of Kant, but nature is also not a product of spirit. There is certainly a second nature, uh, which is the self-production of spirit. But as we know from the structure of the system, nature and is not uh, reducible to uh, spirit. So somehow uh, nature is a part of that. When I say that the world is the limit for uh, for spirit, well, nature, I think, plays a role uh, in that regard, in the sense that nature is checking the self-actualizing activity of, of spirit. So you can say there is, uh, nature is telling when re natural resources cannot be exploited more than to a certain point by spirits, economic or technological activity, for example. So uh, that is not a self-regulating uh, activity of spirit. That is spirit that is bumping against a hard limit that doesn't belong to spirit. So, um, I, that's how I would answer, uh, and I and I and I think that uh, at the end of the philosophy of right, I mean Hegel is dealing in when he's uh, um, presenting Weltgeschichte as the culmination of the philosophy of right. He is really taking into account a sort of more uh, problematic uh, development that is open-ended. And that's where the field of contingency that is also a natural contingency has free range. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so Megan? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, sorry, I missed some of the initial part because I was having some computer issues. Um, but my question, I think, is uh, along similar lines um, of uh, you know what Charlotte asked about where does nature fit in, and the previous question was also pursuing that line. I'm interested in asking it from another side about where uh, where kind of time comes in for you. And uh, especially this aspect of history, because you, it feels that that you know the approach is far. Why one worries about where's nature and what kind of contingency it's posing, is because everything is posed f far more from a cultural historical kind of uh, place. This position of imminence from which the work of uh, interpretation is being done, and. Uh, it just wasn't clear to me, you know, when when you make claims like when the philosopher can't escape their time, or this uh, question of imminence, exactly what is the notion of history that's involved there, which is also one where, uh, you know, you're saying that, um, you know, the philosopher can, at another point you said the philosopher can get past time, but not the world. So it seems time is not part of the world, is time part of nature, is there a time of the world, in your sense of the world, uh, what is this historical aspect at all, if it's not a sheer presentism? Okay, okay. Um, thank you, thank you. No, no, uh, maybe there was uh, a little misunderstanding or I wasn't clear enough. Uh, I, no, I didn't say that the philosopher can get past time. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, really commenting on that passage where Hegel uh, say, uh, quotes, uh, gets that uh, 
sentence from uh, Aesop, Hic Rodus Ixaltus, and says the individual cannot leap over his own time. And I say, yes, that's totally true. No one can leap over their own time. But also, I was saying, we should insist that we cannot leap over our own world. And somehow, yes, we can leap over our time in imagination, for example, uh, or, but that's not a medium for philosophy, Hegel says. But yes, I, I think you have a, a good point. Um, time is, the world is in time. Uh, yes, so uh, that is a constitutive dimension of the world and it's a constitutive dimension of reason precisely because reason is actually in the world and uh, is a constitutive dimension of all the figures in which the concept instantiates itself. Um, now, uh, obviously, there is a time of nature in the same way in which there is space. Those are the first moments, immediate and um, most abstract of the philosophy of nature. But the time of nature is not history. The time of nature is a cyclical time. So uh, when spirit comes to the fore, uh, spirit changes. The time of spirit is different than the time of nature in the same way in which the space of nature is different than the space of spirit, okay? And uh, so, and spirit builds on the space of nature and builds on this time of nature, but history is properly the way in which uh, spirit actualizes itself. Now, the idea of uh, history, I mean, the world, uh, the, the uh, German word Weltgeschichte, okay, it's, uh, it's also important and interesting, okay, and it's not Hegelian, I mean, all the contemporary uh, use that uh, term, but that is the universal dimension of history in the sense of here there is an element of space, really, is the time of spirit that embraces okay, the different geographies of nature as well, okay, is a history spread through and across the whole world. And here I want to say that is a, what a first signal of what history is, but history uh, and that's what I, I spell out in the second part of the paper, uh, history doesn't move as one. There are many different times, okay, it, within history. History is not just one monolithic current. It has a multiple, multiple processes within it. You have different culture, or different parts of the world that arrive at the same uh, result with different timings, okay? So this flux of history is not monolithic, but is internally differentiated. And, uh, and on the other hand, we shouldn't forget, okay, the, the, uh, Hegel's main idea of history or, or Weltgeschichte that has something to do with the actualization of freedom, okay? History is the process of self-actualization uh, of freedom. And uh, now what is important uh, in Hegel as opposed to all his contemporaries is that for Hegel, the subject of history 
okay, is the political state. Okay, so for Hegel, the agent of history are political states. He, history is made by, uh, is political history, okay? Um, and that is really why, the reason why the Weltgeschichte is the last moment of the philosophy of right, okay, at, after the presentation of the state. Uh, so uh, there is no moral goal to history. The goal of history is not the highest good, okay, but is the self-actualization of freedom. So I don't know if I answered your... If I can just quickly, uh, you, know, you brought us, I think, to the point that is the most pressing for me, that you know, if you pose it in those terms, then philosophy, especially in the encyclopedia, as part of art, religion, philosophy, it's not clear if that's part of the time of world history, right? And, and that's an old kind of a problem. Where is this absolute spirit? Is it part of the process of world history or not? And so uh, I feel like you brought us to that point. And, you know, the, the other interesting thing that you're saying, this kind of more, uh, less in the phenomenology and more in uh, how the later Hegel starts thinking, especially as he's having to deal with world history herders, uh, with the pressure of all the, uh, the Orientalists, essentially, uh, on his mind as well. And you're thinking of this more multi-layered kind of history instead, rather than just one linear march of freedom. So, I, I mean, I, I, no, I don't have a question except how do you sort of, what, what's the answer kind of a question over there between, you know, the objective spirits ending and philosophy, which is supposed to be for you in some sense an eminent part of objective spirit and the idea of the state as it's unfolding, etc. But yet it's supposed to be at another place. And I know, you know, even when you were talking of Plato as a kind of a cultural critic rather than as just an idealizer, you are still trying to stay on this side of the line of uh, the philosophy being part of world history in some sense, but it also seems to transcend it. And that's a place I'm worried about. Sorry for the yes. long question. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, you're, you're just formulating in another way uh, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, tension or the problem that you find Hegel himself formulating uh, in his, at the beginning of his lecture on the history of philosophy. And he's saying, well, this is exactly the problem. How is it possible that uh, philosophy deals with an idea that is eternal and structures of truth that are eternal and unmoving and unchanging, but at the same time has a history. Uh, yes, philosophy deal with history that is objective and worldly, but at the same time is eternal uh, and absolute. And so uh, the way I read this is really to say the forms of absolute spirit um, are dimensions of objective spirit. Uh, art, religion, and philosophy are completely incomprehensible outside of the structures of objective spirit, outside of the structures of uh, the Zittlichkeit of the ethical world. And that as far as contents, of course, but also as far as form, because, uh, and that is the reason why art, religion, and philosophy have a history, okay? Uh, so, but at the same time, okay, uh, conceptually or systematically, art, religion, and philosophy grasp something, okay, uh, a dimension of truth that is not reducible 100% to the temporality of the ethical world and history. There is a value, and this is what the absolute, okay, is that exceeds the structures of the ethical world, okay? Uh, so in the sense that there is a value, okay, 
to the the uh, the forms of uh, I don't know Greek art that uh, although that specific form cannot be understood except under the specific uh, conditions of the Greek world, that form or that artifact speaks uh, to later civilizations and speaks of a truth that is also completely free of the historical contingencies. So I read the absoluteness of those, the form of absolute spirit, really simply in the sense of being both radically conditioned by the temporality and historicity of the objective world, but also somehow exceed that world. But uh, you cannot understand philosophy uh, unless you put the philosopher and that theory within its own time and world. So that's really how, um, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so Sina. Thank you, Professor. I really enjoyed reading your paper and thank you for your presentation and Charlotte's comment to really help me to better understand the core arguments. So uh, my question is about the position of eminence that you described in the paper. So uh, I found this argument in your paper that uh, it might seem that uh, this position of imminence might defy uh, the critically uh, interviewing the way that we experience the present. So yeah, my question was how, uh, it wasn't really clear for me how we can answer this critic because yeah, there's no doubt that there's something wrong with how we experience the present time because, you know, there are two major wars right now in the region. And maybe this idea of this position of imminence where the whole thing somehow uh, is the product of this imminent process of uh, history and imminent process of the war. And I was wondering, don't we, in this situation, don't we need a more radical theory, somehow abstract from this imminence and to criticize what is going on in our present time and what this position of imminence can bring to the table? What, what, in what way it can help us to better criticize and show what is wrong with the way that is history goes and the way that we experience institution in our present time. And specifically in a, one passage I saw that you say that uh, to understand the change might imply that to practice a change. So I was really interested about this situation, how, how we this understanding of imminence can help us to practice change and change this whole situation right now. Okay, well, thank you. That That, that is a, a great question. That is exactly the problem that um that i'm uh, that interests me more most in what what i take to be uh hegel's dialectic so uh thank you thank you for this question uh well okay so my starting point is really to think that uh hegel has a great point in saying that the solution of a problem is really nested within the problem. Uh, it, it's all there, but we really need to deeply comprehend what he calls the Sache selbst. Uh, so the idea of dialectic is to immerse yourself in order to understand the contemporary world, the discomfort of a crisis, you have to live through it. So the idea of having some kind of abstract theory that is outside of the problem 
and considers it with some kind of either neutral eye or omnipotent wisdom is, is a failure, does violence to actually the problem at hand. This is really the language that Hegel is, is using. If you really want to find a solution to the problem, you have to let the problem speak for itself without imposing the outside perspective. Okay, that is what Hegel calls the logic of the understanding, the reflexions philosophy, and so on and so forth. So dialectic is inviting us to to the position, to live the position of imminence, to practice the position of imminence, to be inside the crisis, to be inside the discomfort of the moment. And it's telling us only by bringing that upon yourself, you can learn how to get out of it. But now this seems all well said and done, but there is a, a problem that we all know that once when we live the situation, that's the most difficult to really understand it. It seems that critique, the term that you also used, needs a distance. How can I bo be, be both in the position of imminence, in the Sache selbst, and criticize it? Okay, it seems that critique implies that kind of distance. And in that regard, what I, I think Hegel is telling us is that we have to pay attention to the fact that even in the position of imminence, okay, there is always that kind of um, movement that it's not at the same speed, okay? That's why Hegel is saying philosophy paints its gray on gray only when a shape, a gestalt, okay, of the world has done its course. So within the position of imminence, we have to, that, that's what I take for Hegel, the task of philosophy is to understand when things have done their course and something new is emerging. So what he's saying is we have, philosophy has to develop a sensitivity to the processes of the world and understand Okay, you mentioned wars, and we're saying, well, phase one and phase two, did something change now? When something changes, that's what is breaking the position of imminence and allowing us to retrospectively understand that perhaps we are at a different point in this process, okay? Maybe we are better off, maybe we are worse off, and we can't keep living with the same solutions. Maybe we have to find a different answer to the problem because we are at a different place. So I'm saying the position of imminence, we have to embrace it. We can't leap outside of it. That's an easy solution. But within the position of imminence, we have to be able to mark different orientation points. Today was different than a year ago. How? And can we still live in the same way as we did a year ago? Okay, so this is what Hegel is saying. Forms of life are normative when they are alive, when they are dead, they are no longer normative, is what he calls the dead positive. So uh, institutions work only to the point that spirit lives in them. When they are no longer vital, they become positive and positive 
the positive is the dead is a is what produces forms of violence is what we have to liberate ourselves from so uh this is to say i don't know if i answer or begin began to answer oh that was great thank you okay great uh that is really good uh cutting yes uh thanks angelica for a very interesting paper um my question I think is very close to uh, Sina's, one of my former students. Um, and uh, so Sina, I uh, very much appreciate your question. And uh, so I'll try to uh, address it uh, from um, a somewhat different angle. Yes, yeah, so I uh, very much agree with your uh, basic point that we need to see how Hegel in the philosophy of right wants to avoid these two extremes, yes, of utopianism uh, and historicism. And this means in a way that he wants to avoid a perspective that uh, prioritizes the future, yes, as, as we do in, uh, in producing a kind of utopia. Um, and on the other hand, a perspective that uh, draws norms uh, from the past, yes, as in historicism. So that leaves us with the present, yes, which is also something that, that you mentioned. Um, um, but in, in, in relation to your uh, um, idea that we should uh, focus on what Hegel means by uh, the present world. Um, but it seems to me that um, foregrounding the uh, world, as you do in your essay, is not really sufficient because it does not allow us to um, uh, appeal to particular uh, criteria. And, and hence makes it very hard to see um, how we could adopt a position from which to criticize certain uh, forms. And uh, while I was reading your text, I was struck by the fact that um, you in, in, in uh, different uh, pages, on different pages, um, suggest that the world itself can provide us with uh, criteria. And I think this, this is um, a, a reason for for questions or worries because it's it could uh, be aligned with a naturalism or or a, a, a type of approach where everything that actually you know is or has been can uh, provide us with norms. And now you in your answer to Sina, you you made this difference between uh, forms that are alive and forms that are dead and, and belong to the past. But I think that that we might need a more specific conception of what it is in Hegel's philosophy of right and more generally in Hegel's philosophy that uh, that functions as, as the norm. Yes, and so you, you say, for instance, at page um, nine, the world is the ultimate test of the powers of philosophical rationality. And, uh, and and further down, you refer to the world as um, touchstone or judge. Mm -hmm. and, and I find this, to be honest, I find this puzzling and even somewhat worrisome um, for, for reasons that also have been addressed by earlier uh, participants. Namely, isn't, shouldn't, shouldn't the, the touchstone be reason? And of course, we would then have to further determine what is meant by reason. Uh, but but to, um, to to assign to the world uh, the the capacity to to offer criteria uh, for our you know uh, reflections on on what's going on uh, seems to me uh, somewhat problematic. Yeah, okay, Karen. Uh, well, uh, let me, uh, so what is the world? You, you talk about the world as some kind of uh, uh, alien entity. The world is what spirit has done. The world is reason actualized. Okay, so then you say another thing, we need a, a criterion that for Hegel, that is freedom. Okay, that is very simple. Freedom is the criterion. 
So when I say that, what is the world though? The world is reason itself, reason actualized. Namely, that means is reason that has done something. When I say that the world is the test of reason, I mean it in a very pragmatic sense. I mean it in the sense of what reason has as a project, okay? A big project, a big political slogan, the test of that project, the test of that slogan, the ultimate test is whether that project, that slogan, that political promise becomes actual in the world. If it doesn't, is a failed promise, is a failed slogan. So the world, I also say, is the public dimension of reason, is an intersubjective world. So what I want to say is the test of reason okay, is the intersubjective social world. Here, I mean it very much in the Kantian sense. If an idea is a secret, is individual, and it cannot become public, okay, it's no good. That is a test, okay? So that is the notion, the world is reason actualized. The world is the public dimension of reason the intersubjective social dimension of reason. So when I say the world is the test, I mean reason that is only in itself and is not like in the language of the phenomenology in and for itself in the public objective world is not rational. Okay, that is what it means that the rational is actual and the actual is rational. It means that reason that tries to escape the world, tries to escape the proof of actuality is reason that shies away from truth. And now freedom is exactly that, is the capacity of self-realization. But what is self-realization? It's the capacity of needing the other of itself that is the intersubjective world. So um, yes, so that's why I, I said, and it's important here that we stress that the world is one. So the, there is no escaping the proof of the world. So I don't know if I, <laughs> uh, if I, I, I think I, I think I answered. I think that's uh, how I see. Uh, so yes, we we need the criteria. What is the criteria for Hegel is freedom? Is the idea of freedom, and 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 really, I think it's important to understand what is the world. And, and I mean, I'm always puzzled, and, and, and I, that's why I want to un underline the world is one. I'm always puzzled when, when they say, for example, no one else over there, in uh, no, no one else except me is in the United States. But when they say, oh, the, you know, Republicans and Democrats, they live in two different worlds. They don't live in two different worlds. The world is one, okay? So to say that we live in different worlds means we're both true in our little bubble, okay? No, the world is one and the world is the place that decides which side is right and which side is wrong. But the world is one. We don't live in two different worlds. And we're both true. And we don't communicate. I don't know. I'm uh, I'm pushing it into some other direction. But I think that's... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Luis, can I maybe uh, ask a follow-up yes. question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, okay, so uh, Angelica, I very much appreciate that you uh, brought in the theme of freedom. Yeah, I think that's very important. I don't think it's very uh, present in the in the text that uh, that we uh, are discussing. Um, so um, I, I think I I, I, I partly uh, agree, but I I still have a certain worry that in your attempt to uh, push back on utopianism, yes, or uh, the attempt to associate Hegel's philosophy of right with a certain type of idealism or tokenism, that in this attempt you somehow um, err a little on the side of historicism by by saying, look, you know, um, uh, the world, as how, how did you put it, um, is what spirit um, has actually done or has actually achieved. Yeah, so it's not just nature or rough stuff, but it's it's what spirit has achieved. Also, for instance, in terms of institutions, but um, but in in this view, I still miss something like uh, the uh, the position from which we can criticize uh, existing institutions. Yes, for instance, if uh, in uh, in North America slavery had not been abolished, someone could say, look, you know, uh, the world. Um, uh, hold on, held on to uh, to to slavery. Uh, so that's it. Yes. Yeah? So 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 we cannot do anything against it because it's the world that somehow decided to hold on to slavery. Yes. And but I think that according to Hegel, it is possible to uh, to judge from the perspective of freedom uh, certain institutions that are simply wrong. Yeah, so there, is, there has to be a kind of normative uh, perspective on, uh, on existing is institutions. Absolutely, and no, absolutely. But uh, I, I think that Hegel is, uh, that seems pretty obvious, okay? And I, I agree with that. But what Hegel is saying is something more, okay? In understanding that, slavery you we have to understand this is what i mean by the the world okay when i when we say slavery is what is slavery okay what hegel wants to say is any kind of institution okay is permeating an entire reality Slavery wasn't just a political system. It was an economic system. It was family relations. So here it's the important thing. Don't attack slavery as just one aspect. The philosopher in understanding that those are structures of the world, you understand that the entire world is structured according to unfreedom. So this is what I want to say. It's like Hegel is making us aware that world is an interconnected universal. So once a, what is the structure of slavery is a way of organizing economical relation, is a way of organizing family relation, is a way of uh, demeaning subjectivity as individuality. It's not just one thing. When, so when I say that the world is what we have to have under our um, is comprehension, this is what I mean, is that things are interconnected. You can't get just one part, okay? And so we have to be aware, it's, it's not just saying it's wrong. What is wrong? It's not just a political, uh, a political institution is an economic form of life, is a form of, of uh, structuring intersubjective relation and on and on and on. So what I wanna say is when I say the reason is in the world, the task of reason is to understand that interconnection. We can't stop short 
of one aspect and say that is wrong is too fast. It's too, um, it cuts off too many aspects. So um, I, I, I agree with you, but that's the aspect I want to, under, want to underline that um, to, to, to say philosophy is in the world. You can't stop short of a little corner thinking that that's it. Okay, I agree with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Angelica, and for the paper. Well, thank and for thank the you, Megan. Discussion so far. Um, yeah. I've got a question regarding your interest in social and political change. Uh, since you mentioned it was the global perspective in which your paper takes place, um, and it's in a way a methodological question. Uh, what are the reasons why you approach this question of change with the principles on the philosophy of right, with the rational structures of the objective spirit? rather than the lectures on world history. Uh, because another option would be to start from the study of what is rational in the historical process. So shouldn't we start from considering directly the Weltgeschichte, uh, in which we see contingency at play, in which we see in more detail the mix of mere Realität und, and Wirklichkeit, um, rather than the principles on the philosophy of right, where we mostly look at the, virtu the Wirklichkeit of the state. And I raise the question, especially given that um, you have an interest with the current political context, as you remind in the conclusion of your paper. So you, you're asking, uh, just to make sure, uh, that w why not look at the lecture on the philosophy of history? Or why not start with the lectures on the philosophy of history? if we want to have a look at um, change as it happens, um, because I think that the principles on the philosophy of right um, lead us to an interest in the general structures of the objective spirit rather than on change. Well, yeah, o o okay. Um, I, I think that history definitely teaches us how have how do things change, okay? Uh, how do things change? That's exactly what uh, change, spiritual change in history is teaching us, okay? Uh, but then there is the question, of how, how can we change institutions? How can we change our life? Those are two different questions, okay? So how do we bridge the gap? I mean, they're certainly connected, okay? So uh, yes, I mean, uh, one could look at history and see how things have been changing, okay? But uh, the question of how can we change institutions, okay, from the perspective of the present requires that we address the question of what are those institutions to begin with, okay? So I, I guess uh, going back to the previous discussion, there is always, uh, going back to what Sina was uh, asking, and th there is always a, an eternal conceptual dimension that doesn't change. And then there is an historical contingent dimension that changes, okay? So we may think uh, that things have changed, but they haven't. How, you know, the surface may have changed, but the core institution doesn't, hasn't changed, okay? You can say, okay, certain 
structures of the slave slavery system are still operating in the form of uh, discrimination. That's just a transformation, okay? Redlining is just a, a cosmetic change, but truly nothing has really changed. You know, you, you can uh, quote uh, Il Gatto Pardo, everything has to change in order for things to remain absolutely the same. Okay, that's uh, the reactionary uh, politics of Southern Sicilian uh, reality. Change everything, but you, so that nothing changes. Okay, so 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 that is what is important is is to understand what is the surface and what is the core, because the core can remain the same and have a lot of cosmetic transformations but really nothing has changed. So uh, that's what I'm worried about. And I, that's what I think the, the philosopher has to be attuned with. So that's why I think uh, the philosophy of right, again, principle of actualization of freedom, broad perspective and of the world, okay, uh, ha is really telling us you should look at what in those institutions are for, what are they about, what is the core rationality or irrationality in order for you to go into world history and understand how things have changed. And you are gonna understand whether this change is just a surface change, okay, dictated by, I mean, you can say, you know, look at the capitalist system, economic relations. You can say, well, in the time of the first industrial revolution and, and now, okay, technology, is that change? Okay, on a certain level it is, but it's it's hard to understand, okay? We have to understand the level of external reality and the level of deep structures. I mean, that's actually what, what Marx has really inherited from, from Hegel. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, Charlotte? Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to come back to this uh, something or two things you said now in the discussion. Uh, one is um, you talked about, I guess, multiple histories and, and having like reaching the same result at different moments in time. And, and like what I would say, maybe principles of freedom that can take different forms and gestalt and so on. But at the same time, you say, um, like, we have to be imminent inside the problem, live through the problem. And so I, the question is, like, how do we know, like, that the result is going to be the same if everybody has to live through their own problem, which is obviously not going to be the same everywhere? Or are you saying there's a multiplicity of, of uh, histories and so on? And uh, so what determines, how do we, yes, what determines the sameness? Uh, well, I, I don't know if the, it's um, the result. I, I'm not sure that the result, maybe I, 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 I'm contradicting myself, but I, I don't think uh, that the result has to be the same. I mean, I think uh, th that all the processes strive towards a heightened level of freedom, but that heightened level of freedom, it's not, well, maybe that is the same, okay? That is what is guiding all processes, but the, the way in which that actualization of freedom is instantiated in reality is very different. It's very different because of the constraints of different cultures, so different uh, geographical regions. So um, I'm not sure 
uh, that the same or or, or I'm saying the same process of freedom has different speeds or has different uh, different ways of manifesting itself. It's not a monolithic advance of one way. Yes. Yes, I sympathize with that. I'm just trying to feel like fit also the idea of there just being one world. So the one world would be the white Western dominated world, I guess, if that if you're talking about one world. And then when how do the different histories fit in? I mean No, I don't think that I want to say no, exactly. The the one world is the world to which the Western dominated world belongs. The I want to say the West the West has to acknowledge that it is not the world, is only a part of the world. The world is something much broader. So you can't say there is the world of the Western civilization and then there are the, 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 the third world, the second world, the third, I'm resisting that language. Okay, there isn't the first world, the second world, and the third world. We are all parts of one world. And we have to understand that what we call the third world is simply a different condition, a different speed, a different way of realizing freedom, a way of fighting against different type of constraints. But that is a part of the same world, okay? And I, I'm, I'm actually fighting against a sort of compartmentalization of rationality, where rationality is only qualified in a certain way and making that qualification into an absolute. And to make it into an absolute is to make it into a world that isn't, okay? So the first world, the Western world, you take a certain dominant culture and you make it the absolute and that becomes the totality of the world. And that is an illusion because it's, the world is much broader. That That's the kind of, so I wanna say, I want to push back against, I, I think the rhetoric that calls each, that's a monadic Leibnizian way of thinking, okay? There are many worlds, the monad is a world unto itself, okay? And I think, uh, I, I, I think that's not true. Okay, I see more a sort of Sartrean uh, perspective in, in which Sartre is telling us in our little tiny single act, we are responsible for the whole world is the recognition of the kind of breath that every single action has. So I, I want, I, I really uh, put the emphasis not on a Leibniz, Leibnizian infinite monadic uh, fragmentation, but rather in the uniqueness of the world. Yes, yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, just one little thing, yes, I think I, for me it fits maybe with the idea of using the master's tool to try to dismantle master's house, right? The, because <laughs> if we want a, like a normative um, basis for criticizing the, the world, then we can use the so-called Western values and say like they're not being respected in, in most parts by Europeans themselves. Uh, I don't know, yeah. Just if if we want to go that way, I think. Anyway, well, sorry. yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh... Yeah. So, uh, 
since there are no other questions at the moment, uh, I think I would just jump in and, and ask a question myself because it is somehow related to, uh, to this discussion. And um, there is the, a certain contemporary perspective on Hegel's philosophy that uh, somehow criticizes Hegel for uh, gener generalizing the process of history and reconstructing uh, everything that happened before from a very situated perspective that he himself never thematizes. Uh, and, uh, and it seems that from that perspective that on the one hand, Hegel is very skeptical about the possibility of leaping the position of immanence as regards history, as, as regards time, and this is very interesting. But at the same time, he seems to neglect all the challenges involved in leaping the position of immanence as regards geography and as regards his own position in this history and all the other uh, domains of the history of the world in which he is, that he somehow neglects when reconstructing the history of yeah. the whole. Uh, of and I was just wondering whether you see uh, some merit to this criticism and how do you think that from a Hegelian perspective, this could be addressed or do you think that Hegel's perspective is perhaps not enough or there are some limits right, to right, so how, how do right. you see it? yeah yeah so so as you probably noticed so I'm really I don't claim that what I just presented is obviously Hegel's position okay uh, I mean, Karen, you know my work. <laughs> I, I'm I'm doing something with Hegel, okay? And I'm saying I'm saying there is this is what I value and I think can teach us a lesson, okay? Uh, and and this is what can make us as philosopher go a step further in reality. So. I certainly recognize that Hegel's uh, own position in his own philosophy uh, does suffer of that kind of uh, blindness or restriction that you are mentioning. At the same time though, I don't know whether, I mean, that is not something uh, I don't know how that can be avoided. I, I I, let's say I also am a little skeptical of the criticisms of Hegel, Kant, and all those guys uh, that are carried out on the basis of, oh yeah, but they were just presenting the perspective of uh, you know the male Western aristocratic and so on and so on and all those kind of attributes. Uh, that may be true, but it's also true that every philosopher, first off, is true as Hegel is saying of Plato, we're always carrying some kind of interpretive lens to whatever we're doing. Second, I'm not sure that simply adding another attribute or saying, oh yes, I'm not looking just at this, I'm also looking at that perspective, I'm also adding that other, okay, the multi, okay, disciplinary, the multicultural. Uh, I'm not sure that that's a, multiplying is not enough. Okay, it may may make us feel good, may make us feel better, but I'm not sure that that's not just one of those cosmetic changes that actually leave everything the same underneath. So um, I uh, I understand your point. I do agree with that to a certain extent, and but I think that. 
that is much more complicated and certainly the solution uh i find it that the solution is as bad as uh what hegel is charged with okay great uh yeah. and just to clarify it was it was not really my position or my point i was just trying to bring this to the discussion yeah yeah no no i totally i totally understand yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. So do we have other questions? Um, so if not, please join me in thanking uh, our speaker, Angelica Nuzzo, and uh, the respondent, Charlotte Bauman, for this fascinating discussion. It was really nice, and I think we learned a lot all together. So thank you so much. And uh, I will just post uh, here on the chat uh, the program of the uh, Leuven seminar this term and uh, the next uh, session is very much related to this last part of the discussion because it will be a book launch uh, of a collected volume titled uh, Fichte in the Americas about the reception of Fichte's philosophy both in North and South America uh, so very much related to this uh, cosmopolitan uh, feel uh, so we are all uh, very much uh, invited to, to join the session. And uh, and please uh, remember that we will keep the Zoom meeting open. So we are all also warmly invited to uh, stay uh, connected. So um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, Manuel, if you want to 